What you're about to hear is from my introduction to Emmanuel Levinas's Totality and Infinity course. These lectures were done to be accessible to people who have not done the reading. If you are interested in diving in deeper, doing the reading, or want access to the deep dives into my notes and the questions concerning translation, then you will want to become a subscriber to my ongoing research seminar. I can save all of that extra content for people who really want to dive in deeper. This lecture is meant to be a lot more accessible. Subscribers to the seminar get lectures I do with my wife, Anne, but they also get access to my deep dives into Das Kapital, Being in Time, and Totality and Infinity, as well as a bunch of other works related to critical media theory, critique of political economy, and the foundations of time energy theory. You can learn more about becoming a subscriber in the description down below. And part two of Totality and Infinity course is going to kick off in January 2025. With that, I hope you enjoy this lecture. Welcome everybody to session one of part one of Totality and Infinity. There will be two parts. Part one is in August. Part two is in January and it spills over. It overflows the concept of January into February of 2025. I'm so grateful that you're all here today. I want to come right back around to what we were just talking about, actually. But i uh, got to say a few opening remarks, first of all. So hello, Terrence and Christopher and Will and Anne and Ken. It's been a while. It's good to see you, man. You made it to a live session. That's so cool. Cesar, great to have you. And Nance, pew, 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 pew. All right. So what we were just talking about before we started recording is Jojo Siwa who is a child star. She comes from Dancing with the Stars or whatever, Dance right? Moms. Dance Moms? Dance Moms. Dance Moms, okay. Well, she was, um, you know, one of the, the, the little lights of this show that, you know, took these children and had them compete against each other. And it was extremely competitive environment. All of the parents who got their kids into it were presumably... Um, uh, the most well-intentioned parents ever, but the conditions that they were subjected to and the kind of parenting that was put upon them was uh, brutal. It was brutal. Like, I've seen videos about it at this point because people were trying to understand Jojo Siwa because she's kind of crazy. Um, and she's crazy because she drives around in a car with her face painted all over it. And... Uh, now she's an adult, so she's not this little kid anymore. She's supposedly this adult. And she's trying to make this transition from from making kid music and dancing to, like, being an adult, which for her is like, I have sex. I talk about sex. I do sexy things. Um, and, of course, she gets a lot of flack for it. But the reason I wanted to use this as an example for what we'll be getting into with Totality and Infinity is because Terrence, I think, said really well, and maybe I'll butcher it here, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, he, he said something like this. Uh, when you're in that kind of position of fame, you're, you're screwed no matter what you do, right? Because if you remain naive and ignorant, then everyone's going to make fun of you. But if you try to or just actually are um, intellectual. If you try to get intellectual or if you just are intellectual in some way, the chances are you're going to receive a lot of uh, harsh with, uh, feedback. Anywhere from, oh, you're pretentious, like that was the example that Terrence was using, to like, oh yeah, you think you're better than everyone else or, oh, actually you, you're trying to be smart, but you're not smart. And that's actually true of all of us, even though obviously it's a lot more pronounced and obvious for uh, any celebrity, but especially a woman, and especially a woman who 
uh, in the public eye was first and foremost a little girl and is now an adult. And so it's like, it's, it's kind of this catch-22, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I wanted to take that and turn it over into saying that when I think of totality and infinity, one of the things that I think about is how we're always already screwed in this sense. Others are always looking for opportunities to totalize us, which is to say, to reduce us to the same. So the way that Levinas will talk about this is the reduction of the other to the same. And that's not just like, oh, see, we're the same, but it can also be through negation, which is to say, um, oh my God, we're not like that. At, we're not like, I'm not like Jojo Siwa at all. Right. Like that's a lot of content being put out by people. The subtext of it is, you know, the set, set the subtext aside for a second. The explicit message is look at this. Look at this stupid girl. Look at this stupid girl trying to say she's a woman, turning herself into an object, constantly saying stupid things, being eccentric with her dance moves, being way too aggressive. Um, but the subtext is. What's the subtext? I just lost it. I had it. <laughs> what was I going to say with my subtext? The subtext, um, oh, is that I'm not like her. When people are critiquing Jojo Siwa, the subtext is I'm not like her. And they find their sense of identity through being not like her. Right? Well, Levinas is going to say that that's still an act of identification. Identification is both in the movement of saying I'm like that and saying I'm not like that. And so keep in mind as we move forward, whenever we say the reduction of the other to the same, we're not just saying that we want to reduce the whole world to being something just like us but ultimately that we want to reduce the world to being our own egoistic or egotistical prop. And so I figured we're all talking about Jojo Siwa before we start the recording. Let's just begin here. Let's just use that as a bouncing off point. Chances are in five years in 10 years, she'll still be around whether she's as famous or controversial as she is today. She'll still be around. Um, no amount of hate ever makes anybody go away, right? And the internet itself as a sort of phenomenon, this medium that we use, is an identity machine. It's, a, it's an alterity shredder. The internet takes alterity and shreds it into little zeros and ones that can be positively identified with or negatively spewed out in this sense that props up the self, props up the ego. Alterity is just this word for otherness. And it's one of the words that you'll have to learn to read this book. There's a bunch of words that you'll encounter as you go through this book, such as Ileity, ipseity, supplication, fecundity, effulgence, and, or sorry, effulgence. That's on page 45. And then octoctonous. Octoctonous. What a crazy word. Why do we have this word? Well, um, there's several things I want to do in this introduction. And one of them is just to say that in a lot of cases, the, word, the words that I just read off, he says them right alongside synonyms. And so, you know, we're working class people for the most part, right? Or at least we're trying to be accessible to people who are, which obviously does not mean we assume that you're dumb, right? It just means that we assume you probably don't fucking know the word effulgence or autochthonous. But let's be fair, most people in college today don't know those words either. <laughs> like these are like very 
antiquated terms. And it just makes me think that uh, Lingus, is it Alfonso, Alfonso Lingus? Is that his name, the translator? It makes me think that uh, he has quite the vocabulary. And that's a good thing, right? We'll be talking about translation as we go, thanks to Terence being here, being a native, well, naturalized, nativized? I don't know. You're, you're more or less French at this point, in my mind, right? 40 years. He's able to read this in its original. And going off of a little, he was able to say it's a good translation so far. And we'll kind of keep, keep coming back to this question of translation. But if it is a good translation, I think it's probably partially a good translation because Alfonso Lingus is, um, has like this breadth of words to draw from. And that Levinas has a very unique way of talking. It's, I imagine, pretty unique in French too, because I've never encountered anything quite like it. Like, encountering a great thinker is often kind of like encountering an alien, right? It's like, we're, it's kind of like you're human. Like, it's really weird to think, like, this is another human being. But then sometimes once you get past all the wordiness, you realize, oh, he's saying in a much more fancy way and a much more deep, deep and profound way, something that I've thought before, right? He's probably saying something that you've thought before. But we have to be careful because that is the reduction of the same, to, of the other to the same. The reduction of the other to the same is that move that says, Oh, he's not actually saying something that I haven't already thought. Or he's not actually saying something that some other great thinker I like hasn't already thought. Right? Now, um, there are profound insights here that are already in other thinkers. Most notably for now, we'll, we'll point out Martin Buber. Martin Buber is the author of I and Thou. It's a book that he says... Um, he doesn't want to take issue with, though it has a different perspective on the thing that he's approaching. He's, so in this week's reading, you'll encounter him on one page talking about Martin Buber. And basically what he says is that Martin Buber focuses on friendship. His point of departure is friendship itself. Levinas says, no, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm focusing on like my point of departure for totality and infinity for this work is the idea of infinity. And the idea of infinity opens up everything. It unlocks everything for this whole book. I'll come back to the idea of infinity versus totality and a bunch of the words that will appear and reappear all throughout this text that function as synonyms or uh, almost like pieces of those puzzles. And I'll also touch a little bit on some other Western philosophical precursors in a little bit here. But this is day one of a course about uh, a philosophy of the other. And so I would be, uh, I guess it would feel awkward to continue without actually doing this little thing where I want to actually just touch base with you all as, uh, representatives of the other, I guess. Uh, you're all each one of you concrete others. You're all here for your own purposes. And I want to start out by um, asking questions of you all, and then you can just raise your hands so I have a proper cue. Because not, not all of you might be able to answer. Some of you might not want to. Um, so just go ahead and raise your hand if, if you have a response to the question that I'll ask. And so my first question is, um, you know, have you read this text before? What is your familiarity with Levinas? I'm interested in hearing from people who, obviously, if there's anyone here who's already 
uh, read this or is familiar with the work by Levinas, by Levinas even if it's a different work, uh, then I would want to know about that. But then also, I'm curious about uh, those of you who are here, who are reading him for the first time, what you are, what you, I mean, what, what brought you to this? Like, what, why are you interested in um, this text? Obviously, it's fine to just say, well, I like Theory Underground and all the shit you guys do is dope and so you're doing this, so that's great and I'm there for it. But also, I am curious to know um, if there's anything more to it for anyone. And, uh, and then outside of me sort of uh, giving like some kind of a rigid litany of, of ways of responding to, to me or speaking in this space, I am also curious um, if there's anything that's on your mind relating to this course, relating to the course structure, the syllabus, um, the way we're going about things, uh, the reading, your fears, your hesitations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I hope that kind of opens up the ballpark pretty wide here and that, yeah, we'll just go. I don't see any hands up though, so we'll just we'll go with whoever wants to talk first. Terrence. Terrence will go first. I first really learned about um, uh, Levinas. It's a long time ago, in um, 1980, but I was 26. And I, I sort of vaguely knew about the name and... Um, uh, uh, vaguely knew he was important and something to do with the other blah blah ethics and then I came to um, Paris and I managed to get an interview with uh, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard um, I'd seen that he'd published for me he was mainly the thinker of uh, libidinal economy he'd published um, uh, that very year two books which were a turn to ethics, was well, sort of implicit in the postmodern condition and more explicitly in just gaming. And um, very quickly he said, you have to read Levinas. And he everything he said turned, well, a lot of it turned about around Wittgenstein and language games and Levinas. And I said, um, well, what's his big book? And he he snubbed me. <laughs> That's an uh, um, impudent question, um, but uh, as if uh, there was just one big book. I don't know what he, or why he got upset, but he said to begin with um, Humanism of the Other Man, so which is a, a short, um, easy-to-read book. Um, so I, I, I read that and I started... Um, buying the other Levina uh, stuff. He didn't say anything to help me read it, but um, uh, I felt, because um, I was trying to understand uh, uh, Lyotard, uh, so I started reading it. And um, for me, I think in your lecture on the preface, you talked about Levina being a, a philosopher of the outside, like um, Nick Land. Um, but I sort of quickly saw that, well, Deleuze is a philosopher of the outside, is a key concept. Um, uh, there's a Scottish poet who was teaching in Paris called uh, Kenneth White, and he's a poet of the outside. And um, uh, he published mainly in French at that time. Now he's publishing uh, or republishing um, in English. He's a uh, old uh, works. And Maurice Blanchot, um, who seems to have been an influence on Deleuze for the um, philosophy of the outside. And I remember, well, just to finish, I remember Deleuze um, saying in, because uh, I was, uh, I, came, I came to back to France 
um, after a little pause, and I was at Deleuze Cinema um, uh, Seminar, and he started talking about the outside, and and um, the context was concepts, philosophical concepts have affects attached to them, and um, that are just as important. And uh, the example he took was the outside, and the formula from uh, uh, Blanchot, an outside further than any other outside, which you could say um, an outside further than any outside uh, included in the totality. And he said, well, you can sort of recite it to yourself uh, because you like it, and it may not, um, you may not know what it means. We have a, a positive affect, and um, it suggests something to you, and so you're going to um, read that thinker, work, work on that thinker, work on that idea, and maybe you'll understand uh, years later, but it's the affect will make you of that um, line of thought, and if it doesn't mean evoke anything for you or uh, repulsion or negative effect, then you have to find somebody else um, to to work on. So that was my initiation into um, uh, Levinas in general and uh, the uh, affective possibilities of the outside as a concept. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I saw your promo for it and it just kind of like felt so kind of now. I don't know. I feel like we really need this now. I feel like people are kind of almost imagining themselves as the other. And I started reading the preface and I didn't understand anything. And then slowly it started coming through and I felt I just got this idea of like the thing. And as, as you said, like with Nick Land and the outside and it just, I don't know, it just felt very present for me. It felt like something that kind of everyone needs to kind of understand today. So that's kind of why why I thought I'd take the course. Then it's Ken and then Cesar. That's awesome, Will, by the way. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad the promo worked for somebody. Uh, yeah, I do you hear me? Yeah, uh, I pretty much do every, like, theory underground course. So I was looking at this Levinas stuff, like an expansion pack to Heidegger. Uh, I really like phenomenology because it's like, <laughs> it's really difficult, but it's also really like rewarding. And uh, I had never heard of Levinas before, and I really actually didn't care about ethics at all. I thought it was boring. But now that I'm like halfway to the first chapter, I'm really into this. I really like the concept of of infinity. It's like, and then you connect it with Nick Land. I fucking love Nick Land, so I'm super excited. That's awesome. All right. So um, I'm very interested in Emmanuel Levinas, or at least this course, um, specifically because I think it's a, it's maybe one of the more challenging uh, topics to confront for myself, which is I... I would really uh, enjoy, you know, just like other other philosophical topics where I could just kind of get in the weeds of things, get into the jargon of things. But the challenge that I think Levinas is going to be proposing to me is, okay, but how do you look outside of yourself, Cesar? And how do you actually put yourself in the situations of having to actually work with other people notice other people um, because uh, I think maybe for a lot of us too, just being bookish, we enjoy being in our book or in our media of sorts, but it's, it's, um, it's hard. It's hard to actually be with another person and let yourself um, experience them in, in a full way. And so uh, this is, this is just going to be a kind of reminder course for me of like, okay, I, that's always going to be the challenge. It's not the philosophy itself, but how to actually practice this. Yeah, I really like that. I want to come back to that for sure. Christopher. 
Hello. Uh, what got me into Living Oz is I think Dave mentioned it, Totality Infinity, and either the Critical Media series or Beacon Time Class. I can't remember which. So I like looked it up and I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm reading this right now. But I like bought it and then I read Mikey's essay in the Underground Theory volume about uh, Levinas on the phone, I think it's called, or something like that. And that kind of like got me excited for it. So I hit up Mikey and he was telling me to get the William Large book and the, the Mench one. So I picked those up and I read a little bit of it. And then I was like, I'm going to put these aside and actually read it. But I was intimidated. And then I found out you were going to do the class eventually. So I was like, okay, I'll just bookmark that for now. Come back to it. I'm just excited because I've been kind of like obsessing over the Heideggerian project for a while. So I was like, how do you call it? The ethical expansion pack. So I was like, let me, let me see what this guy has to say. So I picked up um, Existence and in Infinity because William Lard recommended it as like a good starting point in a, the interview you did with him. So I read that and then I saw the exegetical you did with Sue. So I was like, okay. And then I'm trying to think what else. I think I bought Time in the Oh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, I think Ethics and in Infinity is the name of the. Yeah, yeah, the, that's what it was. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I picked that up. I really enjoyed it. And then I ordered Time and the Other as like something to read when I'm not reading this book, just as like a precursor. Cause I feel like instead of just diving into the secondary sources, which is very appealing, if I can get in his kind of mind's eye and see where he is coming from and like the broader language he's using, the signifiers, it'll give me a better understanding. So. I'm excited for the class. This is my first time reading Totality Infinity. So I think it's a good place to be, especially with fellow obsessives, as I think uh, Cesaro was saying too, like get your face actually in the book. And then just the accountability of you guys and the big other, just like, hey, I need to read this by such and such a time is my motivation. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Christopher. Yeah, and it's good to have you for this one. Um because you were there in Being in Time. How many of you all were there for Being in Time? I don't know. Ken was there. Nance was there. Anne was there. Terrence was there. Cesar is shaking his head, and we did not have any Cesar. Zachary Hilty joined this call some at some point, and I want to say welcome to Zachary. Welcome also to uh, Chris Jones. And Spencer Tillen and Amanda or Mandy, as well as Artie and Orla, who are not present but are accounted for. So, you know, not everybody's able to be here for everything. That's just the way of it. Orla took being in time as well. Uh, she listens to it to the lectures on her drive like she does a long drive every week and so um she was she would listen to the lectures but she wasn't able to attend and uh she's also one of the monthly subscribers like a like a like a member but she's never been able to come to anything via zoom and that's okay it's nice to know i told ken the same thing it's just it it's nice to know even though he's not usually there for things that he and Orla are there in the background, you know, and they're not the only ones, but they're the main ones that come to mind for me because they communicate with me about it. A lot of other people just do it and then they never communicate about it. But it's great to know that there are people who are treating the on-demand content like it, like it's as valuable, as valuable as these live sessions, you know, uh, because one of my biggest fears going into uh, this kind of online work was the recorded stuff becoming kind of just like, it's just treated like it's just like, oh, that's so last year. And it's like, no, I don't want to do it or have it recorded if it's not, you know, treated as though it's like something that can continue being a resource. And so, yeah, shout out to Orla and everybody else. Uh, anybody else have any final uh, things that they want to say in, in, in way of, or by way of introduction or, or any kind of questions about the syllabus or any kind of questions about, 
uh, anything so far, anything that you have already read or uh, your general approach to reading, any, anything else, any final I have a remainders. question for you, Dave. Okay, let's go. Uh, I want to know, what was, why did you feel like you needed to talk about Levinas in this book? Because I know it's something you said you put on the back burner, but eventually you knew you needed to get around to it. So why do you feel like it, it needed to happen for you? That's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll actually use that to kick off where we go once uh, I think Nance raises it. So we'll come right back to that. So sorry, but that's a great segue for me. I just wanted to, to comment on the fact that there does seem to be something like contemporaneous about Levinas. There does seem to be something um, that like needs to needs to come out, needs to address current conditions and, and tendencies. Like we're all the media landscape forces us into like a like a two dimensional world as far as how we relate to others and how we see our ourselves. Um, and we kind of don't have selves anymore. We don't have like fleshed out selves. We have like two dimensional identities um, that are. I don't. I don't know. It just like it feels very contemporary. It feels very. Um, it feels very pressing. And I'm happy to see that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, and I. I think you're actually going to go on to talk about that as far as why it needs to happen. So. Um, yeah, that's what I'll use. And then I guess I want to hear from Anne. I was going to say, Nance, I don't think Nance or I actually... Yeah, I was going to use Anne and Nance as my two examples um, for two approaches to this class. And I'll explain what I mean by that after I've allowed you both to state how you are approaching this class. Because the chances are I might be wrong, but I'm going to set you all up for that. And, oh, I'm going to step out of the room while I listen. But I'm, but I'm listening. Cool. Well, I'll go first just to say that I was interested in this course. And I've been interested in Levinas for a while. I think just partly because I know that Levinas is such an important part of Dave's project and being Dave's wife like I want to be on that level but then my own reasons is I've been wanting to kind of get more into like ethical philosophy especially in thinking about as lots of you said just kind of our current situation um, with everything from like Jojo Siwa and the internet to our politics and I think just to have this basis is really important to approaching the current kind of polarizing situation in a thoughtful way. Um, I think what Dave was referring to in the way that I'll be approaching this class is I probably won't actually get a chance to do the reading at all because I'm simultaneously reading 50 different things prepping for this course that I have that I'll be teaching in two weeks at um, our university. And I'm like, I can't add another book like I literally don't even have time to do the readings that I need to do for this course and for CMT and so Dave's like I'm like I should just not do the course and Dave's like well just show up to the lectures then and you'll be thinking about this stuff on the back burner so at the point that you do have the time to sit down and read the book like that'll already be there and so I'm just not even going to say, oh, I'll try to do the readings. I'm just going to say, I'm not going to be doing the readings. I will not be at the discussions. I will be here taking notes for the lectures and just thinking about this stuff. And it will, I'm sure, excite me to want to get to the reading as soon as I possibly can. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Nance? Um, I'm, I'm excited to dive into the, the deep end or jump off the cruise ship that, that I kind of ride around the world on and just get lost in the ocean. Um, that is this text totality and infinity. Um, I'm excited to do some exegetical reading sessions, hopefully with others in this course. Um, but really taking the time to slow down and 
give myself the grace to pour over a small section of this book if I need it. Um, and, and then to come back and, and discuss it. The, the order of discussion and reading, I think is, is interesting. Um, I think it'll, uh, my, my hopes is that it'll like prime me for what to be aware of, what to be looking out for. Um, as I, as I go through the reading. Um, but yeah, I think that this is one of the, one of the courses where you do it on hard mode, just like with being in time, just like with what we've done with capital, um, where we just, we, we go balls deep, sorry for that into the text itself. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be able to, to go, go on hard mode. I think this is one of the, one of the ones where you'll get the most benefit of doing it on hard mode. Thank you guys. All right. So now I can hear myself. Um, thank you. So Nance apologized for saying balls deep, but I'm going to, I'm going to roll with it and say, I think the difference here between Anne and Nance to be more inappropriate is just the tip <laughs> versus balls deep. No. <laughs> Anne said, how dare you? Um, we got to put money in the jar now. Yeah, there's a... When we were on the tour last year, right at this time, well, no, a couple weeks from this time, we uh, and had to start a dick jar. Anytime there was any dick joke, we had to put money in the jar. So, you know, okay. She says, I do not condone this behavior. <laughs> yeah, laughing is consent. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Inappropriate. Um, no, going, going, going all in and actually trying to do the reading is the way that you will get the most out of this. But if your situation makes it so that it's impossible for you to actually do the reading, I want to make sure that you are, you are able to get a lot from these lectures. It's which is part of the reason that we've structured it the way we have, which is my assumption is that none of you actually did the reading for this week yet, and that you will do it after this lecture in preparation for the discussion on either Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time or on, sorry, on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. Or on Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time, noon Eastern time. So the reason that we've done it that way, even though it takes way more effort for me, is because I think that it's worth the effort. I think it's worth going over everything together. And I want you all to feel like you have like this window of time between the lecture and Thursday or Friday to do the reading. And I want that window of time to be kind of short. The longer that window is, the less likely you are to even get to it. And the more likely you are to beat yourself up profusely for failing to get to it. You'll notice there's nothing on the syllabus about reading reflections. There's nothing on the syllabus about any kind of writing assignment. And that's something I've struggled with ever since the being in time course. There was kind of like this, hey, you don't have to do it, but you can do it. And then a few people like Sue or like Sean, they did it. Chad did it. Like there's a few people who did reading reflections. I think Nance might have even done one or two. But the point is, is like at some point people fall off and they, they're like the, the absence of, of, of anything on it is conspicuous. And I don't know that that is the most helpful thing. What, what could be helpful is like submit your notes as a post. You know, my notes are like sometimes I just have a sentence for a page. Like page 37 says home equals site where I can. And then in brackets versus house equals I cannot question mark apartments as an 
others equals cannot stuckness. That's all my note says. What does that even mean? Well, I have to sit here and try to decipher it after the fact. And I think I could. I could probably break down what that means to you all. But it's mainly a note to my future self when my future self is like, what happened in this book? And especially if like my future self is like, oh, wasn't there something about X, Y, or Z? I'm trying to make it so I'll be able to find that thing. And actually, this, this note page that I just read off of is not the same stack of notes that I do my general um, note-taking on. And so I'll explain the difference uh, between these two things really quick, and then we'll get into my response to Cesar's question. And so basically, this is something I started doing on the third reading of Being in Time. It's something I wish I'd started doing 10 years ago. And it's basically every page I have to say at least something so that, so it's like, I have a stack of notes where I have said something for each page. And my biggest goal is not to summarize what happened. And that, that would be a much bigger task. And it's probably not good for a first pass anyway. But instead, just to be like, what's, what is he talking about on this page? And if I can't actually tell you what's he, what he's talking about, then I should be able to tell you what I'm confused about. For instance, uh, whenever you do see the word effulgence come up in this week's reading, um, my big question was like, wait, is he saying that's good or bad? Is he saying that that belongs to transcendence or is he saying that belongs to uh, interiority? Is he saying... Wait, what's he saying? Because sometimes he uses this, this sort of like as if voice where he like says a whole bunch of stuff and it's beautiful. But then you're like, wait a minute. He's saying that that's the dumb thing to say, right? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, it, and that's the same thing with Heidegger. A lot of the times when you think they're saying something, they're actually saying this is something people say. And then he goes, but anyway, that misses this thing or whatever. Um, so, of course, people wrongly attribute to these thinkers positions all the time because they're missing that sort of as-if voice because they get overwhelmed in the paragraph and forget what came before it, which is just part of your brain needing to get used to stretching to the length of several paragraphs instead of, like, you know, taking everything in bite-sized, you know, form. It's almost like we're all used to eating baby food. And, and this is steak, right? And, uh, and we, you know, we, we choke on one bite, but there's a whole freaking T-bone there, you know? And, and this kind of stretching your mind around it goes along with this idea of comprehension, right? Like, can you comprehend a multiple um, clause sentence, right? That's already a big feat, in the attention in the age of the attention economy in the in the age of being distracted well what about a three page long paragraph or well fuck it if you're reading Kierkegaard it's a three page sentence sometimes right so you know can you can you wrap your head around it well if not um, give yourself a break and realize there is no stairway that will get you there step by step you really do just have to dive in the deep end. And that's what you're all doing in your own way. Anne's doing it just the tip, which is to say she's priming this sort of sight. This, this, she's already got this idea of loving us. She's already got this idea of totality. She's already got this idea of infinity. It's going to get a little filled out. She'll add a whole bunch of other question marks. And then over the next year, those question marks will get slowly filled in because the unconscious will be doing its work. She'll keep coming back to it when she's not even aware that she's coming back to it. Um, one day she'll get struck by lightning. She'll think that she's just discovered some deep insight. And she'll be like, wait a minute, did I maybe get that from Levinas? And then she'll be like wondering about it. Maybe she'll want to go over a lecture. And of course, I'm just using Anne as a metonym here for the kind of reader who's not doing the readings, who probably won't even be attending the lecture, or sorry, the discussions on Thursdays or Fridays. So Anne's like this sort of stand-in representative of that bigger whole. Whereas Nance is going to be this sort of stand-in for that other whole. And then, of course, Terence is the, 
like the that on overdrive you know in the original you know reading the the original french translation which is amazing okay but bringing it back to the thing i'm trying to say about the note taking you have a stack of notes that goes chronologically page by page where you just you're you're saying i have to write something about every page and sometimes i write like anywhere between five and eight sentences but a lot of these sentences are like things like you know i wrote inadequation equals insufficiency right like that's a really useful note if you can figure out when he's saying this thing he means this thing write that shit down that's one of the most useful things you can do there is this term when i was listing off all the terms that are so confusing like illeity and ipsaity and supplication there is this word that looks like it's kao auto it's greek it's k it looks like k a zero or o with a little apostrophe and then it looks like a v t o look i don't know greek alphabet and i but i know enough to know that those are not really v's those aren't really a's and so you know that that v might be a u it doesn't matter guys it doesn't matter it doesn't matter. Take that as a, uh, an algebraic placeholder when you see it and fill it in as you go. And also, if you pay attention, he uses the word manifestation, comma, and then he uses this Greek word, comma, and then he goes on. And then every other time that you see that word, if you think manifestation, it makes sense of the sentence and or paragraph. It does every time. Also, you'll notice that that word appears um, beside other talk of manifestation, right? Something revealing itself, right? That's what we're talking about. Something becoming apparent. Um, so that's the general approach. I don't know Greek. Uh, I look forward to on Thursday or Friday, someone who potentially spent the time digging it up and goes, oh no, this is how that word functions in Plato. This is how that word functions in Aristotle or in Heraclitus or Parmenides, who, whatever. And so we'll, we'll get like this, this extra layer, but that's not necessary. Uh, you don't have to go tracking down every word on, on a first reading. You don't even have to track down every word on a, on, on a different, especially when it's an adjective and he gives off a litany of adjectives in that paragraph because he says the same thing over and over and over again several different times within the same paragraph. Also, as a general rule with continental philosophers, if they say something on one page, they almost always restate it one and a half pages later. It's, it's a weird rule. I noticed it with being in time. I pay attention now. It's almost always true. They almost always re-say it, but in a slightly different way. And if you do notice that, put the little page number right beside. So let's just say on page 44, they say something. And then on page uh, 46, they say something. Well, write 44 right beside where he says it on page 46. And then go back to page 44 and write 46 right beside where he said it on page 44 and what that does is it makes it really easy to find themes that are maybe not as obvious otherwise and it makes it really cool to write papers later whether you go to college or not and you end up using this in like official uh, scholarship or not um, being able to say yeah when he talks about or when she talks about this thing and then you use a quote and then you go on a little bit and then you use the other quote from just a couple pages later, that's beast mode. It looks really cool to be able to use multiple page numbers to get at the same idea. And like I said, it happens every page and a half usually. Um, of course, then it will come back 44 pages later. One of the interesting, I mean, okay, I'm just throwing random numbers out there. But one of the interesting things that you'll actually see is that he talks about the sun, S-O-N, in this week's reading. Well, I was under the impression he doesn't talk about the child until the end of the book. But he actually talks about it right here at the beginning. Talk about foreshadowing. It's really cool. Um, I think I remember in my previous two readings of this text thinking it's kind of this curveball. You get to this idea of the child. 
And of course, the problematic thing pointed out by Luce Irigare and I think also Simone de Beauvoir is that he sneaks the word son in there as like a, as a replacement for the word child. And Simon Critchley in The Problem with Levinas brings that up, of course, and in bringing it up, uh, basically made it sound like Levinas is all sneaky for talking about the child, talking about the child, and then all of a sudden throwing the word son in there. And I just want to say, I didn't find the word child here in these first two chapters. I only found the words, word son. So actually, Simon Critchley, the foreshadowing said he's already thinking of the son, not the child. And, you know, is that because of Judaism? Is that because they use the father's name to pass on one's legacy? Um, is there something deeper about it? Or is it, like Luce Rigure says, that he is just an, a transcendent autistic guy? Like, she, she says, like, autistic, she says, like, transcendent autist. I think is how she says it. Um, which just means that even when he's most radically thinking about the other, he's ultimately just thinking about passing on his name. Right? I don't think that's true because he does tend to lead with the orphan, the widow, the stranger when talking about the other. But there's a really interesting move from orphan, widow, stranger to child as son and child as son definitely makes me think of like the direct extension of the same versus like orphan widow stranger think about it even in terms of like pops pop evolutionary psychology right that is used to like explain the dating game oh men men are trying to pass on their genes right like even even in those terms um the widow and the orphan could not be more other to the man, right? There's nothing more other to a man than an orphan or a widow. The, the widow is some other guy's wife, and that guy's dead now. But she's, she's she, she, furthest thing from a virgin, she's someone else's. She probably mourns that guy. Like, that is, that is what does that have to do with me? Nothing. Nothing to do with me. Absolutely nothing to do with me. From a strictly evolutionary psychologist sort of standpoint, the, the widow should not have any pull on my conscience. Right? She is radically other to me as a male. This is a book written by a male. I think he's unapologetically a male. Um, now, there's not a page or a chapter where he unpacks that and he does like this sort of uh, reflexive calling into question of himself like, hey, so how does my read how does my phenomenology perhaps get distorted by the fact that I'm a male? He never does that. I think doing that would have probably made Lucer Rigore a lot happier. Um, but instead that's for us to figure out. The orphan is someone else's kid, the widow is someone else's wife, and the stranger might take your kid or your wife. The the stranger might also kill you. From the standard um, rational actor looking out for its own immediate interests, these three examples that he always goes back to are extremely other as opposed to, yeah, the child and the son couldn't be more your own, yours. And I'll get into why I think that is uh, eventually later. For now, I'll still say it in, bro in, in the most broad outline possible. And that is the reason he goes to the orphan, the widow, the stranger to think about the concrete other is because they pull into sharp relief how the radical or absolutely other nonetheless pulls at our heartstrings. Nonetheless, awakens something of a conscience in us. And that's interesting. That's fundamentally interesting. It would, it would not be as interesting if he was saying your child crying out because they just got their hand cut off 
does something inside of you. You feel something. No, that wouldn't do anything. Like your, your little kid scrapes their knee. Well, yeah, of course you feel something. That's your progeny. You should care about them, right? But why do you care about a little black child crying that's not yours, assuming you're white? Why do you care about a widow? That's someone else's or used to be like, why would you care about that person? That has nothing to do with you. He's trying to say, well, you, it does do something. So he's going to keep going back to that example for radical alterity. But what he's getting at when he talks about the child is a rupture in being. A rupture in continuity. Yes, you are passing yourself on in the most direct possible way. But you have absolutely no way of knowing what that child is going to be like. And the more you try to control what that kid becomes, the more it will backfire. So the radical alterity of the other, the otherness of the other, in terms of the stranger, in terms of somebody you just met, in, in, maybe in terms of somebody you feel like you've known for quite some time, that radical otherness brings surprises. And the fact is, is you can know someone for 20 years and then be so surprised. So surprised. Like, uh, I heard somebody recently commenting on how surprised they were that this one couple was still together. They were like, 45 years, still married. Blows my mind. I can't believe it. I never saw that coming. Yeah, but in the same way, it could be that couple that you were always like, yep, no, they'll stay together forever. They break up five years later. You find out that it was the most abusive relationship ever. And you're like, what the hell? The otherness of the other is surprises, is a shock to your games of predicting things, blows away plausibility altogether. And the orphan, the widow, the stranger are metonyms for the uppercase O other, the concrete other, insofar as they're not yours, man. That's what he's saying. And I'm positing this. This isn't something I've found in secondary text, but it makes the most sense to me. Whereas the child is the exact opposite of that. But you'll find in both of these cases that they defy the odds. They are not predictable. There is something infinite about them. And the idea of infinity is, of course, his point of departure in this text. Now, I was going to say a couple things about the preface. Uh, I am hoping everybody already watched the video of the preface where I read the whole thing and do exegesis, and I also do a couple of asides. It was very important asides, such as like, putting on a pedestal and sort of fetishizing the Holocaust as though it's the only bad thing that ever happened. Um, talking about the ideological capture of every bad thing that then turns, turns into some uh, careerist mode of access for some representative that's trying to join the PMC. Uh, you know, th that was one aside among many, many asides that I find or you know that I'm going I'm going to assume that you've all been over and maybe they'll come back up again but I really am hoping that everyone has a chance to go over the preface without going um over all of that again I'll just say that you know the whole preface is kind of framed around the idea of war and politics and history you can put war politics and history all on one side and then put morality, ethics, and the other with the idea of infinity on the other side. On the side of politics, history, and war, we have totality. On the side of inf uh, the other ethics, morality, we have infinity. Totality and infinity always opposed. But not opposed like they're mutually exclusive. The idea of totality 
in some sort of a way proves to be a sort of basis or site for comprehension of the, of the, of the infinite, even though the infinite by definition escapes our grasp. Now the relationship between totality and infinity is not dialectical. And that's really important because the habit of every theorist schooled in continental philosophy, or even just taking on by osmosis certain ideas because you hang out around theory people, everything becomes dialectical. And now it is great that Zizek has made us realize that uh, dialectics need not mean synthesis, that in fact dialectics can really just mean trying to wrap your head around irreconcilable contradictions. That understanding of dialectics and of Hegel is not Levinas's. It's not anybody in France. Everybody in France was going off of Kojev and Hippolyte, and Kojev and Hippolyte were all the Hegel anyone needed. People just went to their lectures. Maybe they read the phenomenology of spirit, but they only read it to a certain point, or they read it through the eyes of, of Hippolyte and Kojev. Um, and even if they had read it through the eyes of Robert Brandom or, or Pippin or any of these other big name Hegelians actually alive, you know, today, uh, they would not, they would not have this sort of Zizekian take. Part of the purpose of the For They Know Not What They Do course at Theory Underground was to try to understand Hegel on Zizek's terms. And one of the questions as we go there, you know, it was, hey, is this Zizek's Hegel or is this like the real Hegel as opposed to like the wrong Hegel being misread by everybody else? I don't care personally too much. I'd like to think that uh, it doesn't matter at a certain level, uh, but also it might. And uh, it would probably be a, hu a huge injustice to Hegel to never try to get to the bottom of it. But, uh, I personally have zero commitments in this life to getting to the bottom of Hegel. Um, I would like to read the science of logic at some point, but for everybody who doesn't feel like they have the time to get to the bottom of these things, don't worry about it. Just take it with a grain of salt and say, yes, Levinas, the relationship between totality and infinity is non-dialectical because what he means by dialectical is that every thesis meets its antithesis and those terms, thesis and antithesis, are sort of equal in some sort of a sense. They're sort of exchangeable in some sort of a sense. They sort of get subsumed probably through um, sublation. They get subsumed into some higher idea, right? And Levinas thinks there's a profound problem, not just with Hegel, but with all Western philosophy for trying to subsume difference and multiplicity to some third term, some neutral term. And for him, he's going to go with Heidegger as his case in point. Heidegger cared a lot more about being than he cared about beings. Right? The idea of being is more important than beings. Actually existing other people matter less to Heidegger than being itself. Right? But for Levinas, this is a problem also in every other great Western philosophical thinker and tradition. And he takes his clue from this guy. Uh, oh God, I don't have the page handy. Is it Franz Weisenstein or something like that? Does somebody have that handy? It's, it's like the star of something. He says really early in that uh, he gets his, oh yeah, it's right here. It's on page uh, 28. Yeah, thanks, Christopher. It's Franz Rosenweig's 
Stern der Ursel Erlosung. Look, could could somebody look up Erlosung? I don't think it matters too much. Um but you go ahead and let me know what that is. Ah, the star of redemption. Yeah. And uh, so he takes a lot of inspiration from, from that work. Basically, that guy is arguing that the history of philosophy, of Western philosophy, they always say Western philosophy because it's like their specialty. They're not going to talk about Eastern philosophy because, come on, spend the rest of their lives getting to the bottom of Chinese and Japanese just so they can make some totalizing statement about the East. No, they're just going to focus on what they have specialized in. And uh, that the, the, the idea is that the history of philosophy is the attempt to reduce multiplicity to one thing, to one idea. So that you can ultimately sit there like the pre-Socratics and say, everything is fire. Everything is water. Everything is being. Everything is etc., etc., etc. That's a good point to do this segue into my response to Cesar's question. My immediate response to why it matters is because I care about the underground. And I think that underground theory will be a waste of time. Sure, everyone will have fun and they'll get a lot out of it and they'll learn how to sound smart at the dinner table. As Pierre Bourdieu says, sociology and really what he means is critical social theory. Uh... It's a martial art. It's a combat sport. Well, why do you need a combat sport? Why, why do you need an intellectual combat sport? Well, because we're tired of being gaslit by people who think that because they spent a lot of time reading books, they can tell us to shut down and sh sit down and shut up. Shut us down. Right? We want to be able to stand up on our own two feet, and that requires having done a lot of readings and not just being able to say, oh, well, so-and-so says, but ultimately being able to sort of think between all those texts, situate ourselves in the fields of the humanities and social sciences, stand up for ourselves, right? Yeah, well, you can do that with theory. You can do that with philosophy, and you can, you can sound smart. Um, and ultimately, it will in some ways help make you smarter in some sort of sense, right? It's not, it's not the same as street smarts. But hey, if you've already got some street smarts, having some book smarts to go with those, that's fantastic, right? Look, I mean, theory in the underground doesn't have to be anything else but that. But I do want it to be more than that. I want to help in the scene giving rise to, you know, actual milieus to not just give itself rise to milieus for the sake of building milieus, insofar as we build relationships with one another, write interesting things and have great conversations and read one another's work and respond to our critics, it will become a milieu. It's inevitable. But I want it to be one that has a positive impact on the world. Right? I don't want it to become one where the people who go the hardest just turn out to be real pieces of shit. So, of course, that raises the question of morals and ethics. But also, there's nothing worse than spending a lot of time reading books and then just using that combat sport to overpower people and dominate them. It's not a good look, guys. And I think it's something I've seen for about a decade in the world of philosophy. Christopher said, no 48 laws of power. Hey, look, you know what? Eventually we're going to engage with that work as well in terms of it's a, it is a very important doxological artifact, but no, if, if, if all we're producing are, are, are rhetorical charlatans and people who use theory to overpower others interpersonally um, I'm going to be 
I'll be sad. I'll be sad because I'll be, I will have contributed, right? I, I think that Levinas is important in several ways for countering that tendency. I, who was it that was just saying, you know, oh, it was Cesar, I think, was saying, like, we are predisposed to being more contemplative. We are predisposed to being more bookish. We are predisposed to whether we know all the names of the moves or not, engaging in this kind of combat sport. Now, let's just say politics and religion comes up at the Thanksgiving table and you, you, you've learned to not engage or you never had the courage to engage, whether it's wisdom or courage or cowardice, it doesn't matter. Um, you think about it afterwards. Right? Every time politics and religion comes up, whether you engage or not, you think about it afterwards. Maybe this means you spend a lot of time shadow boxing and you don't engage in actual dialogue with concrete others. Or maybe you do engage with concrete others, but it's not dialogue. It's actual see how you can outsmart them, see how you can make them look foolish to the third person. Or see if you can make them feel embarrassed or intimidated. Philosophy in theory is easily lent to this. And of course, most of the content that we have on the internet is somehow participating in this. Right? It's a lot of it's like the subtext is I'm good, I'm not that. The subtext of a lot of stuff is I'm beautiful, I'm not ugly. I'm smart, I'm not stupid. I'm strong, I'm not weak. Whether that's physically or spiritually, it doesn't matter. Ken said, Levinas seems essential for not becoming an asshole while reading philosophy and theory. <laughs> Anne said, I'm not Jojo Siwa. Yeah, yes, yeah. So much content is about I'm not Jojo Siwa. Even if it's not saying I'm not Jojo Siwa, then Jojo Siwa can be a metonym for whatever is ugly, Whatever is stupid, whatever is bad, I'm not that, right? But Levinas is essential for not becoming an asshole, even though I think some degree of, of assholery is, is also inevitable. I'm not saying that this is going to make you all not that. I'm also not going to say it's, look, the other thing that, you, that, that Levinas can do to you is turn you into a perpetual doormat that is welcome to the other. A doormat that says, welcome, other. Wipe your feet on me. Right? A, a, a doormat that says, come on in, stranger. Here, come on up to my, my bedroom. You want to read my diary? Right? That is the the sort of opposite direction one can go in. So on the one side, we have the asshole who wants to possess and dominate and control conversation. And on the other side, you have the person who turns themselves into a perpetual doormat. My biggest problem with Levinas uh, is that he does have that effect on people to some degree. Um, that I personally was heavily doormatted. I doormatted myself uh, when I got into Levinas because I wanted to be a good person. I desperately wanted to be a good person. I was like, fuck, I've always been like this selfish asshole where I've always, even if I didn't think I was being selfish and an asshole, I was ultimately solipsistic, narcissistic, self-centered, whatever words we want to use. And I was like, ah, Levinas. Yes, there's like an actual profound philosophical basis for not assuming things about other people and in fact treating other people as though they are my master treating other people as though they are my teacher treating other people as though they are like the noble savage that is that is what Levinas will do to you if you play the believing game a little too hard right what's the line from Tropic Thunder you never go full retard well, here at Theory Underground, we say you never go full Levinasian. 
<laughs> you never go full Evan Ossian, guys. Um, except I would say, honestly, give yourself over to it. If you can, do it. It doesn't hurt to do it for a year or two. Like, maybe, maybe don't go full in, but like, it's okay. Uh, it's okay to play the believing game here. The worst thing that it will happen is you'll turn yourself into a bit of a doormat. But if you already have a proclivity to do that, and by the way, I think I already did, right? In every previous relationship I'd ever been in, I think ultimately I already was oscillating between turning myself into a doormat and, and at the same time being self-centered. Um, there is just this danger there. So there you go. That's your caution flag but why i initially originally got into loving us uh is because uh it's probably as as simple as this heidegger was besides marx the most important philosopher i encountered in my philosophical journey in in the sense of like what he did for me right like marx was the most important because he got me thinking about what it means to be, to belong to the working class. Um, it was through Marx that I was able to realize, oh, there's big structural and political and economic factors in play. So I can't just blame other people in my life for being pieces of shit um, or neglecting, you know, neglecting their children, uh, you know, kicking their dog, whatever it is like, okay, People are responsible, but also that person does not have on their horizon of possibilities more than a few ways to be like they really don't have that many ways to be. And they also don't have any way of making sense of this split that they have between their ideal self and their drive and their need to just argh, do stuff sometimes. And, th and the fact that when they do that stuff, they end up not recognizing themselves afterwards, right? I didn't have that language either. That language I just got from psychoanalysis. But the language of the horizon of possibilities I got from Heidegger. The, the language of structural, political, economic uh, conditions and alienation I could obviously get from Marx, right? But the horizon of possibility stuff, though it probably became one of the most important things about being in time for me, uh, first being in time was profound in challenging my atheism. Not because... Heidegger, when he wrote Being in Time, was a closet religious guy. But because he was an atheist who also had a profound distrust of the appeal to science as the be-all, end-all solution giver to all human problems. And in fact, he puts it back in its little playpen in the same way that Kant originally tried with his distinction between the phenomenon and the noumenon. Right. So with Descartes, we do radical doubt. I'm, I'm going to do this quick little speed run of, of philosophy up to Levinas. And I'm only going to touch on Descartes, Kant, Husserl, Heidegger, and then we'll go to Levinas. Okay. That's, that's all I'm going to focus on. Um, and, and in doing so, I'll end up bringing it back to this, you know, question that Cesare asked. But really, that's going to be, that's, that frames everything to come here for the next half hour. So Descartes practices rattled, radical doubt. And a, the reason he's doing this is because he wants to find a, uh, a working relationship between science and religion. And if you read it and, and believe him, then he believes in God and he's also religious and he just wants there to be a nice working relationship between these two things. If you want to play the sort of Straussian skeptic game, then he could be trying to usurp the power of the church while at the same time, like just get his foot in the door and sort of weasel science's way into, you know, having its, its own sovereignty. And maybe he knew that that would ultimately wreck everything. Um, of course, I don't, I don't think you have to know Straussian sort of hermeneutics of, of uh, or sort of esoteric hermeneutics to, uh, to get to that. I think that there are people who just have that kind of hunch in general when it comes to thinkers like Descartes, like religious people who are like, no, bullshit. You know, and Nietzsche is a good example. Kierkegaard's a good example. Both of them will talk about how basically God gets turned into the God of the philosophers, right? 
God becomes the, the God of the gaps. God becomes the first mover. But ultimately, God is displaced, used to just kind of patch over the things the science can't answer. And obviously, that subverts the central role of religion. And God, the church, the church fathers, the pope, etc., well, whether Descartes means to or not, he definitely helps the rise of science the, uh, and, and what becomes the Renaissance, which culminates in Kant in a sort of sense. The Enlightenment thinkers are sort of epitomized by Kant. Um, and it's between Descartes and Kant that liberalism arises. And liberalism and its bourgeois revolution is going to be um, a sort of non-centered centric figure in Levinas's work. It's there and it, pays a, it plays a central role, but it's usually not named. It's usually not pointed out. But Levinas has a huge problem with liberalism, even though he's not a communist or a fascist. Right? He's a, pro he's a profound thinker of of, of not either of those three options, right? Alexander Dugan, the supposed uh, Rasputin to Putin, you know, the, 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 the thinker who uh, Zizek doesn't even take very seriously, but who I think, you know, you can't not take him seriously considering the fact that it's likely the CIA killed his daughter last year, considering the fact that he's fluent in over 17 languages, considering the fact that he does represent sort of like this Russian ideology, whether that's true or not. Um, he's, he's not exactly someone I think that we can just shrug off. Um, he wrote this book called The Fourth Political Philosophy, where he says, like, look, there's only three genuine philosophies. And for him, philosophy and ideology are the same thing. That's one of my problems with Dugan. Um, there's only three fundamental ones in modernity. It's liberalism then it's communism, and then it's fascism, in that order. And, and he thinks that liberalism won against communism and fascism. And in winning over those two other options, liberalism took on the worst tendencies of those two other uh, tendencies. And, and so liberalism is for Dugan basically this hyper-individualistic, there's only one way. It's universalist. Everything is exchangeable, commodifiable, right? Liberalism. But it's also communist in its chauvinism, in its universalist chauvinism. That's, one of the, that's what he took to be the, the, the worst thing about communism is, you know, it's a one-size-fits-all solution for all human societies, and it's going to wash away all particularities, and everyone will be, you know, post-class and the same. And then... Uh, fascism, his problem with that being racism, well, liberalism super racist too. Well, Alexander Dugan doesn't like democracy. And I think that a lot of us are democracy skeptical in various ways. I'm not going to go into all the reasons why various people here might be. And it doesn't really matter. All I'm trying to say is that uh, he, he actually thinks that democracy turns out to be pretty totalitarian. I mean, Marcuse also thought this, right? It's not that, it's not, it's not like Dugan's like the original thinker of this. But the reason I bring up Dugan vis-a-vis -vis Levinas is because Levinas is this thinker of something that's not communism, that's not fascism, that's not liberalism. Well, today, popularly, that's what Dugan is trying to pass himself off as. Whether he is genuinely doing that or not uh, is the question. And most people would say his fourth political uh, ideology is actually just fascism slightly rebranded, right? It's slightly rebranded as what calls itself multipolar. Um, well, if Dugan was ever genuinely interested in understanding the situation and was practicing this sort of Cartesian radical doubt, the chances are he wasn't. But if he was, um, I, think he, I think he would have 
been a lot more love in ASEAN. I, instead, I think he was in a hurry to come up with a political application. Right? And I think that anybody who's in a really big hurry to come up with a political solution for their current problems isn't in this sort of free space to be genuinely critical in the way that I think Levinas is being. So Levinas would be similar to Dugan only in, this in the sense that he is challenging liberalism, communism, fascism. But Dugan rushes forward into sort of a, a reverse synthesis. He wants to do a reverse synthesis of what liberalism became, which was sort of liberalism with fascist and communist features, right? Well, Levinas, he's going to instead say, I'm not going to rush forward into any solutions, guys. I'm going to spend my whole life taking this resolute stand in defense of the human that overflows subsumption to the same, that overflows our attempts to categorize, to classify, to conceptualize, to comprehend, to put into little boxes. He says, no, I'm going to insist on the human. And I don't think that when I first discovered Levinas, I was aware that Levinas would be the most important thinker for countering Nick Land or for countering post-humanism, transhumanism, or anti-humanism, which are all different things and worthy of their own courses. But Levinas is, is a staunch defender of the human but at the same time, he would say that nobody in Western philosophy adequately theorized the human. That there's something about the human that is more than just the fact that it is irreducible to its tools. There's something more about the human than just the fact that it is irreducible to its language, to its rationality. But those are the standard definitions of the human. The human is the being that uses tools, homo faber. The human is the being that is rational, the rational animal, Aristotle, right? Um, oh, we're, we're, what makes us unique is that we have language, right? No, Levinas is going to say there's something beyond all of that. And it has to do with this idea of infinity. In fact, I think he thinks that it is language, rationality, and tools, three ways of defining the human, that threaten to erase the human. So uh, that's another reason for Levinas, but not ultimately the reason that I got sucked into Levinas. What, got, what sucked me into Levinas was that I was already essentially delivered over to philosophy. I was convinced that philosophy was the path to take. Maybe I thought everybody should do philosophy. Maybe I thought just me. I don't care. I was just convinced the philosophy is where it's at, right? And I was an atheist. I said that. Well, Descartes is sort of the model philosopher. He calls everything into question. And he's trying to do this re reproach, reproachment. Is that how you say the word, Terrence? I'm, I'm sure you know. Reproachment. The, this working relationship between the church and science. And the way to begin that is to say, well, philosophically, let's subject everything we take for granted to radical doubt, assume we know absolutely nothing, figure out what's the starting point to begin a philosophy, and then build out from there while kind of respecting both uh, church and science. So I was, uh, I was convinced that that was the proper maneuver, but that either Descartes was disingenuous in his way of trying to keep the church in the picture, or uh, he was just grossly misled or mistaken. And the example of what I take to be, well, perfect for thinking of this is his ontological argument for God. It goes like this. Step one. Our idea of God is of a perfect being. Step two, it is more perfect to exist than not to exist. <laughs> Step three, therefore, God must exist. 
And I'm just like, I'm, I don't know. I, whoever found that convincing? Why did any, surely this is not real. And of course the Straussian, you know, art, you know, what is it? Uh, is it called art and persuade? What's the, oh, it's called persecution and writing or whatever. Like that essay by, by Leo Strauss basically says every philosopher is writing under a regime. And the regime always might kill you if you go too off outside of your lane or say things you're not supposed to say. And so they end up having to say one thing publicly. And at the same time, they're saying something that only like the super insightful, super smart, super sophisticated disciples are going to see and be able to interpret. And part of what he says is like, hey, when you see Plato writing that Socrates is saying, Something like, you know, oh, of course we give to the gods, but we give to the gods. Of course we believe in the gods, even though he's obviously in everything he does and says, like, not a believer in these gods. We should take those little uh, signposts as signposts to the big other that say, don't kill me. <laughs> I'm going along with the regime. And, and therefore, that's the esoteric writing coming from the philosopher. It's meant to dupe the the bureaucrats the statesmen the censor and he's kind of like winking and nudging the more simplistic and stupid a philosopher seems at some point in their work the more you should be going okay is this a wink and a nod to the real thinkers and ultimately a don't kill me to the big other of his time right so for me, I was always like, yeah, man, I kind of think that Descartes' ontological argument is just like this sort of signpost to the big other. He's just saying, don't kill me. Like, <laughs> you know, hey, let's, let's find this working relationship between, uh, between the church and science. And he's just hoping that the, that the church people are, are going to take him at his word that he believes this ontological argument. Well, the reason it's so hard for me and anyone like me to take it seriously is like, how do you go from like our idea of God is of a perfect being to like, therefore he must exist. Well, and analytically the word perfect, it, it, it includes this idea of existence, I guess, but it's like perfection and existence. Why would those two things have to go together? I don't know. To me, it's just a profoundly weird thing. So we're going to move into Kant, Husserl, and Heidegger here. But I, I will also just say that Levinas does something with this argument that is, I think, profound. And that is the idea of infinity itself. It's not a perfect idea in the idea that it is complete. Infinity is not complete. Infinity includes its incompletion, its incompleteness. In fact, the idea of infinity is something that we can sort of begin to wrap our heads around. And then, of course, it all just falls apart. I think that maybe this reading of this text, this, 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 what is this, the third reading? No, this is, I may, but it might be my fourth. I don't know. But this reading, I feel like this is the first time where it really struck me, like the profundity of the idea of infinity. You know? It's an idea that can only stand in for what it's trying to point at. And what it's pointing at is definitionally incomprehensible. So that's why it's going to be his point of departure. But he, you'll see this in this week's reading, he gets a lot of that from this, uh, this relation uh, to uh, the ontological argument, to Descartes, to talking about perfection. So just, just pay attention when you get to that, that that's kind of what he's doing. He wants to get at the idea of infinity. He's essentially making, he, instead of using the ontological argument to argue that God exists, he's using that same sort of formula to be like, hey, the idea of infinity 
it gets us at something that we can't actually get to in thought, yet it's nonetheless real, and there's evidence for it every day in our lives. So phenomenologically speaking, it's a problem. Phenomenologists like to use things like tables and chairs and lecterns to talk about being or beings because it's right in front of them and they're, 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 in, the, they're in the lecture hall and so they, they slam the table and they say, it's right here and then I can look at it from this standpoint and then I can look at it from that standpoint and every standpoint I take up is revealing while it's at the it's simultaneously it's concealing but like ultimately, you know, the table it's like this intentional object and of course like I have like this mental construct of it that maintains like all of these points that I take up to it, you know, like phenomenal, just do this kind of thing. Well, try to do that with the idea of infinity. It all falls apart. But it doesn't just fall apart. The idea of infinity is generative. As he says in the preface, it's, it, it, inf what is it? he turns it into a verb. Infinity, infinition. Infinitiate? What is it? Infinitient? Yeah. Infinition. T-I-O-N. Infinition. Infinitiation is like what he's getting at. Right? It's like this, it's like the motor almost. It's like this motor of production. But what is it producing? Well, in part, it's producing a relationship. And we'll get into it. First door on the left. So then Kant is obviously the, 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 the essential precursor to Husserl and Heidegger. He establishes this, this division between phenomenon and noumenon. Um, the phenomenon is what appears. The noumenon is that which is beyond appearance. And, of course, questions about um, free will and the existence of God and the, the afterlife, the eternity of the soul, like these are, these are questions of metaphysics, of, of, of fundamental reality, and they might belong to the noumenon, but we want to be able to say things about them, and we want to be able to deduce whether they are, in fact, real or not, and Kant's more interested in uh, coming up with a rigorous sort of, let's, let's appreciate the fact that these two things are separate, and then try to understand what separates them than he is in trying to just argue for God or for free will or what have you. And I'm going to do this tremendous injustice by just saying what stands between the phenomenon and the noumenon is the, the, the subject, the you, the me, the human. The human has a mental apparatus. We've got all this stuff that we bring into it. All right, Terrence, take care Take care. See you Friday. The factory of the mind is the way that Lee Braver puts it. It's like, uh, I think he says it that way, but it's basically like your mind has like this factory um, and it has to make sense of the data of the world. It has to structure that data. And we see things in a uniquely human way because part of what it means to be human is to have that human sense making apparatus that takes the, the, the data of, of, of actual things purportedly, we, we assume actual things and it filters that stuff, right? It filters that stuff through this apparatus, through this factory. And we get these mental constructs of these things for navigating the world. And he goes into the different categories of the mind and time and causality are a couple of those very important sort of structures without time and causality like we would have none of the perceptions that we have, right? Well, I mean, that's kind of weird because you would think that time and causality exist outside of us, right? We see the billiard balls hit each other and ricochet and... And oh, that's causality, and and where, and of course, it wouldn't make sense that first A, then B, then C are these different points that the billiard balls take if it wasn't for time structuring that whole situation. Yeah, well, Kant is pretty sure that these things are, even if they might be real outside of the mind, the mind 
has these categories of time and causality for filtering the data of the outside. The outside being the numinous and the phenomenon being that which is sensed, which is the product of this sensibility fortress, this, this uh, production of phenomenon factory, the mind, right? And I think it makes a lot of sense that you could even just do some, some basic armchair evolutionary psychology to say, yeah, there's no real reason to believe that what we see around us is the way that it would look to all other creatures, much less to a creature that has an objective outside position, because we evolved to engage with this planet in specific ways. It was advantageous for the human mind to come up with certain ways of filtering existence. That's how we survived. But that doesn't mean it's the most real way of perceiving things, right? Um, and that is a course that like the, uh, Simone and, uh, what's his name? Let's just talk to him. The Collins guy. What's his name? What is it? Nance? I know. I just, Malcolm. Thank you. Yeah. Simone and Malcolm Collins in their, their book, uh, pragmatists guide to religion. They don't, I don't think they say it's Kantian, but they basically do this appeal to evolution and say like, we have no fucking clue. Really, we just have, ultimately what they're saying is we just have phenomena, right? Well, Kant establishes this distinction. Well, Husserl wants to go deeper. He wants to actually get to the, to the, to something. Now, he's not going to say to the noumenon, but he thinks that there, we can get to something deeper than just appearances. If we practice disorienting ourselves from the way that we typically take things. If we bracket out the natural way of perceiving the world and instead develop a rigorous method for countering the habits of the mind that naturally see it in the way that it does. If instead we, we stop assuming the world exists for itself and for instance start going, insofar as I'm perceiving things, I'm perceiving those things for me. I'm always in my own way. I'm always out ahead of myself seeing these things, and I see these things for reasons, right? They exist for me is part of like what he's getting at with the, the, the phenomenological epoche. This phenomenological epoche is this sort of thought experiment that is meant to counter the natural attitude. It's supposed to say, these things exist for me. They do. They, they do exist for me. Even fossils exist for me. Quinton Miyasu, fossils exist for me. Now, of course, they didn't for all the time that they laid there in the ground. But at the point that they're a part of human culture and we have to make sense of them, we have to make sense of them. Insofar as we have to make sense of them, they do exist for us. Then you could say even the unknown exists for us, right? Which is crazy because there's like a seemingly infinite universe out there with probably other life on other planets and we're saying they in some sense they even exist for us he doesn't go that far but um there's there's something profound here because he wants to disorient us from this tendency to just fall into this way of thinking that says oh it's just a world of objects and then we are subjects and then we have to ask this question about how do we even get outside of ourselves and how do we actually know anything about that world of objects and of course the traditional epistemological approach would say ah it's the adequation uh between the idea and the thing like this correlation between the idea and the thing like that's 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 that that's real knowledge that's truth when you get to that well Husserl is trying to develop a method for doing philosophy in a world where science has put philosophy in a remote department of the university that doesn't really matter and is saying, oh, you guys argue over words. We talk about facts and we answer all the fundamental questions. And Husserl's like, actually, all of those scientific facts are facts for people. You can't act like they came from a genuinely disinterested search for truth. There were 
genuinely interested human beings doing the thing that got us these facts in the first place. All of these fields arise as responses to genuine human strivings, right? There's always some kind of motive driving it. It's not pure, oh, I'm just indifferent. I'm just looking at things, just stating facts. Of course, it does get to a weird point where it's like, you know, a person finds themselves studying something they're completely uninterested in. And, and they're like, ah, oh, yes, this is just science. No, dude, you are like pursuing grant money and there's vested interests and you might not know what they are, but there's a reason they want you studying that thing, right? Like uh, the, the, the example that uh, Jeff Schmidt uses in Disciplined Minds is like these scientists studying infrared technology and they think that it's for this one reason when in reality it's for, you know, space lasers for like rockets and stuff like that. And it's like ultimately all funded by the military industrial complex. And he goes through example after example after example of the supposedly hardest sciences being directed by the interests of the military industrial complex, usually laundering their money through front organizations. Although, of course, it also is done in the name of marketing for capital, for, for hijacking or coercing or co-opting or directing, ultimately manipulating human subjects to buy more things, usually, right? Husserl doesn't get into any of that. He's like surprisingly devoid of any kind of a politics or awareness of the economy, um, which of course is going to be Pierre Bourdieu's big critique of both him and Heidegger to be like, you guys do assume some kind of a politics, right? Well, Heidegger comes along after Husserl's focus on intentionality. And look, in this reading, you'll find like noema, noesis. Those are just terms for the thought, the, the object of a thought and the, 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 the construction about it um, that Husserl comes up with. Uh, intentionality ultimately always points us back to Husserl. Uh, but for everybody who took the Heidegger course, whenever you hear intentionality, think of concern. So for Husserl, the intentional object, whatever you are intending, I'm intending this Yeti uh, coffee mug, uh, and, and uh, I'm intending it in the sense that it's for me, in the sense that I reached for it, I grabbed it, and I'm thinking about it. It's a, I have a mental construct or representation of it that I can keep thinking of even after I put it away. Um, so this is this intentional interaction with this, this thing, right? Well, what, what Heidegger would say is that it, it's an object of concern. And for, for, the, for every object of concern, it happens on a horizon uh, that he talks about in terms of circumspection. Circumspective concern has to do with our average everyday dealings in the world. And the, the, the things that we have a circumspective relationship to um, put in another way, we could say that we have like this sort of precognitive relationship to them, right? And any intentional or con uh, any, yeah, intentional object of concern happens on the, happens on the foreground, but for there to be a foreground, there has to be a background. And the background for this coffee cup is not just the, the table upon which it sits or the hand whose shape it fits, but also the background of people who've spent their entire lives farming coffee beans in Guatemala or Nicaragua, right? Like they spend their entire lives being reduced to nothing but farm hands to make it so that I can have my coffee in the morning. That's part of the background conditions of intelligibility and for this to even exist in my hand, right? Of course, I don't need to know any of that context. There's also just the actual background in terms of all the other shit in the room that I'm not focusing on in the moment. The other stuff throughout my day that I'm not focusing on in the moment. But any, anything that you foreground assumes a background. And the background changing can change the signification of the foreground. Okay. Well, Heidegger gets at this in his own way. Husserl's whole approach is a lot more, um, what's the word? 
uh, not individualistic, solipsistic. It's a lot more solipsistic. And later he'll add in the life world, but he does that because Heidegger's already critiqued his approach in the logical investigations. Husserl's approach leaves out the life world and is basically like, oh, there is a conscious perceiver, radically skeptical, trying to make sense of its world. We've bracketed out the natural attitude. We're going with what we know for sure. We're trying to see things in radically new ways that are not this natural attitude. And Heidegger comes along and he goes, yeah, but it's so solipsistic, my brother. Why are you doing it this way? And then he says, no, we got to go, we got to go to the world. We got to start with worldhood. We're going to focus on the development of the concept being in the world, right? That's our point of departure, right? Dasein for Heidegger being there is being there in the world. And so we can't make sense of what the human being is as Dasein without understanding what that world is. And of course, he's not talking about the planet with rocks and trees. He's not talking about the objective world full of objects, right? He's talking about that meaning-filled world that has language structuring it. But beyond the relationality of language, there are actual assignments. Like this coffee cup has an assignment. And the assignment of this coffee, sh uh, coffee cup came before me. Human beings long time ago figured out you don't have to go down to the lake and lay on your belly and scoop the water up to your mouth. We can make a, a shaped thing with a, with a hole and scoop it up and then we can drink from that, right? Yeah, oh, it's even better than the hand, guys. This is a great invention. And everyone was like, you better copyright that. You'll make lots of money. Just kidding. They didn't invent copyright yet. So somebody, somebody's children's 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 children deserve to be very wealthy right now. But yes, cups. John Cup. It. John Cup. <laughs> it's John Cup. John Cup, man. And his poor, poor children living in a ghetto somewhere. Yeah. He never got what was rightfully his. I mean, they would own the world right now. Same with the person who invented sliced bread. That person. God damn. I think, I think his name was Slice. You know, great. John Slice. Anyway, these are assignments. This cup is assigned within a referential totality of equipment. The coffee beans, the coffee grinder, the coffee filter, the coffee maker, the coffee cup, the coffee shop, the distribution line uh but also the actual like however it gets to this country like the whole every step in the process of production uh from when it's hard from when it's planted to when it's harvested um all of that is not just relations relations flatten everything and heidegger says that within the first few chapters of being in time relations flatten everything for Ferdinand de Saussure, everything in language is just relations of similarity and difference, right? It's the differences between the words rabbit and tree and bush and dirt that ultimately give them their signification more than their actual definitions. <coughs> but ultimately, uh, de Saussure, in trying to found a science, he has to delimit the region of beings that he is focusing on and the, the kinds of beings he is focused on are signs. So he delimits the region of beings. He says, we're just going to focus on signs. I want to come up with a general science of signs. That's what Saussure says in his general course on semiotics. Well, that's great. But do those signs have references in the real world? Not for Saussure. He's not interested in that. There's only signifieds and signifiers. Signifiers are the, the, the words on the page or the noises from my mouth that point at actual concepts, signifieds. But what about the real tree? What about the real rabbit? What about real dirt? What about non-concept outside of the concept the actual thing well this is part of the way that relations flatten everything 
if everything in semiotics is just relations, then they're all equal. A tree is equal to a rabbit, is equal to dirt, is equal to uh, your grandma, whether she's actually alive or dead. It doesn't matter. It's all just words, man. It's all just signs. It's all just signifiers and signifieds. Well, one of the beautiful things that Heidegger does is he, he's not arguing with Saussure. I don't even know if he knows about Saussure. I've never seen any evidence that he knows of Saussure, much less Peirce. Peirce's semiotic system actually has references, which is nice, as opposed to Saussure. Look, I'm not, I'm not dunking on Saussure. He's just trying to get at a specific object. He's got to delimit his field. He's got to focus on a specific region of beings. He's focusing on linguistic things, signs. Sure, that's fine. Um, and, you know, C.S. Peirce, the pragmatist in, a, in the United States, who came before Dewey, who came before, you know, William James, who came before uh, Richard Rorty, like the original pragmatist, C.S. Peirce, was a polymath. And he has to develop his own science system because he's trying to understand everything. And so he's thinking signs and if his are trifectas instead of uh, these sort of like, instead of there just being two sides, the signifier and the signified, he also has the referent. Okay, but we're not going to get into that. Heidegger has his own way of getting to the referent, which is to say that no uh, equipmental totality, which is to say totality of equipment, no whole of equipment, is just made up of relations in this sort of abstract sense. Everything is assigned a function within that totalized system. The hammer is the famous example. You know, the analytic philosopher would say, what is a hammer? Well, definitionally speaking, it has, a ha it has a handle and it has a head and it looks like this. And then the other analytic philosopher goes, no, it doesn't have to look like that. It could look like uh, this water bottle as long as it fulfills the function of hammering a nail. And so the analytic philosophers will argue about what the actual definition of of it is. And what Heidegger is going to do is say, oh, look, guys, yeah, it's the function. It's the function that it serves. Also, it's how well it serves that function. But ultimately, that function doesn't make sense if you just foreground it and bracket out those background conditions. Those background conditions of intelligibility are uh, necessary, which is to say the hammer is assigned to the task of nailing and nails are assigned to the task of fastening down two by fours and two by fours are assigned typically to the role of interior walls within a house and two by sixes are assigned to the role of the exterior walls of a house and they might be actual studs within that wall or they might be the baseboard or the the i forget what it's called but like the the the, the ones that run parallel to the baseboard along the top um okay point being these are all assigned to certain tasks they're made for those certain tasks well there's bigger reasons that they're assigned within that referential totality that is not just relational right? That is to say, they have a directionality to them. They fulfill a function towards something more than just that task, but towards something much more important, such as the, the, the goal of survival itself, right? Sure, you can build birdhouses, but long before humans started building birdhouses, there was a different kind of house that they were building, and it was for themselves, for ourselves. We build houses for us, more likely someone else builds houses for us, right? I spent a lot of time building houses and it's a fascinating project. But nowadays, houses come along with a lot of extras, a lot of extra bullshit that is meant to just give it some kind of value on the market. Oh, how close is that house to a school? How, cl how close is that house to a grocery store? Oh, does that house have a nice looking lawn? Does that house look more or less the same as all the other houses on the street? Does that house have extra bedrooms? Does that house have a double garage? All these extra questions come in. Those are all extra to the task of surviving and have a lot more to do with what Baudrillard is going to call sign value, which is just a way of inflating 
exchange value. So we're far, far beyond use value. But at the level of use value, you put together some tree branches and you make a little lean-to and that's a house. In the same way that a rock hitting a stake could be called a hammer, that little lean-to can be called a house. It's a function that it serves. The meaning of words when they're not just made up bullshit words that are extra in the same way that the double car garage is extra, the essential words get their meaning not just by being different from one another in the Caesarean sense, they get their meaning within a system of functions that is defined by a goal. And Heidegger will call that goal the for the sake of which. Right? All of those things exist for the sake of dot, dot, dot. All of those things exist. The hammer, the nails, the two by fours, two by sixes, exist for the sake of shelter, which exists for survival. So Heidegger spends the first several chapters of Being in Time developing this idea of being in the world and everything I just gave you was one single example of what he does in the development of this very complex concept, being in the world. The most disgusting and sad, terrible thing that people do with Heidegger is they read a few Wikipedia pages about it. Maybe they read the first few pages, they give up, they go on with their lives, and then they just say, being in the world... And what they mean by being in the world is this sort of like poetic dwelling, like, oh, we're not humans just to work jobs and be tools for capitalism. We're humans to being in the world, man. And so they think like they kind of cross wires with late Heidegger, who's like all about like the dew on the grass and everything. And he's and, and they just think that's what Heidegger is getting at with being in the world is like. It's sort of this hippy dippy beatnik, like, oh yeah, man, like I'm non instrumentalized. I just hang out with the trees, my brother. Like, that's what they're thinking of. That's not what Heidegger's getting at with being in the world. Though, of course, there is a beatnik deep down inside of him, and he lets that freak fly later. But no, when he's developing this concept of being in the world, he is also developing a theory of language. A a, a theory of extimacy, what Lacan calls extimacy, Heidegger talks about as ecstasis. The fact that we are always already out ahead of ourselves, the world is outside of ourselves. Our, our usage of the things around us all invoke and belong to and wouldn't make sense or function without these larger contexts. So he is the thinker of context. But that context is a context with others. In the same way that the in order to, the assignment towards which, the all of these things for the sake of, are parts of that being in the world idea, so is being with. Before there is any idea of an individual, there is being with. At, at bottom, that's the most important thing, right? It's one of these existentialia. Existentialia are just the word he uses for, th this is a plural form of the word existential. Existential with the E at the end, that just means an existential structure of our being in the world. Every, exist every one of the existentialia is a structure of our being in the world. Okay. Well, Levinas loves this and he runs with this, but also he is, and I'm now I'm being brutally unfair and simplistic here, but he is also um, not just a student of Husserl and Heidegger, he's also a Jewish man who lived through the Holocaust and lost everyone in his family. And so even though he was a huge time fanboy of Heidegger at once at uh, one point in his life, he also becomes deeply, deeply uh, uh, betrayed by Heidegger joining the Nazi party. And when he's, th when he's sitting in this POW camp after fighting with the French resistance against the Nazis, he starts really thinking about where does my philosophy differ from Heidegger's? 
And he goes, you know what? It's Heidegger's emphasis on being over beings. He's like, I care about people. Heidegger doesn't even really care about people. He cares about being. And so bringing it back around here to this question about why Levinas, um, it was Heidegger who helped me understand that science isn't the be-all, end-all. It doesn't get the last word on some of the most important questions that have been with us for as long as humans have been thinking. Uh, but at the same time, science serves the function of turning people's brains off. It becomes a sort of thought terminating cliche. It terminates the movement of thought. It terminates thinking for oneself. Now, of course, there's a terrible backlash to that where we just are so skeptical of science that we can never take anything on authority. We can never take anything on expertise. And then we just become anti-science lunatics, right? Uh, I think that it's, it was a lot easier to talk about anti-science lunatics for me prior to COVID. After COVID, it's just like, oh my God, guys. Public health is not a science. Public health is not a science. And every time people tried to act like public health is just a science, just listen to the experts. It was like, guys, insofar as a scientist is calling the shots that are political and have to do with the economy, <laughs> they're not functioning in their role as a scientist. They're functioning in the role of a, of a politician, a, 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 as a bureaucrat. And you might not like where conservatives tended to go with that, but there's something there, right? And so we're in this interesting time where we don't want to just be reactionaries against science, but also we don't want to just roll over for this thing called science that isn't even properly scientific, right? So we're in an interesting time when we are called upon to be more responsible for how we think about things. Okay, well, that's all my sort of disclaimer for this, you know, Heidegger and science, because I was an atheist. I like this Cartesian idea of radical doubt. And then, uh, a professor I really looked up to was like, look, our conversations keep ending where we can't continue until you've read Being in Time, much less Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. And I was like, ah, damn it, I have to do that. That's a lot of work. Well, later I was like, oh, Levinas. That's where like the other comes in. That's where ethics comes in. That's where morality comes in. And by the way, he uses those two words absolutely interchangeably. It's just moral, morals and ethics. It's the same thing for him. Um, in all other material at Theory of Underground, I use morality to talk about like the personal, so, sort of like this confrontation you have with yourself in solitude, as opposed to ethics being how you navigate the social, how you are responsible to others. Now, of course, these two things are related to one another. Um, I'll probably be another 10 minutes here. But those two things might be related to one another. But... Uh, I like to keep them distinct. Levinas doesn't. Okay. Uh, so Levinas, bringing it all back around to the idea of not being a domineering asshole, he is about the fact that the foundation of everything, including reason and philosophy and politics and history, the irreducible ground of all of those things, which itself cannot be grounded on anything else, is this relationship between me and the other, between you and the other, between the face-to-face. -face. And the face-to-face -face is not to say the actual image of the other. It's not the, like, like I'm, I'm pinching my face, right? This is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the face as human expression. The face as human expression, which is to say, not just the words they use or the fashion statements that they make and the ways that they dress up their naked bodies. We're talking about the nudity itself, not a sexualized nudity, but the nudity that would feel awkward, right? Levinas talks about like, you have like the, the person who gets naked for an art exhibit and does all the things the director is telling her to do. And he says, that's not nudity. She can feel right at home, no embarrassment, no shame, but that's not nudity. Nudity is nudity insofar as you feel vulnerable and ashamed and your defenses are lowered. 
which is to, and you're not vulnerable if other people can't use it against you, which is why you shouldn't be so vulnerable with the stranger, right? This nudity, this vulnerability, you should think of those two words simultaneously. And this sort of sense of shame are all indications that outside of our immediate circle of comprehension, outside of our immediate pursuit of satisfaction and avoidance of pain, there's something else, something other, something outside that calls us into question. And we can become so full of ourselves that we think our shit doesn't stink, that we think we sound smart when we don't, that we think we understand everything. And of course, if we just had a little bit of distance from ourselves, we'd realize how absurd all of that is. It's the other that calls into question the same. And reason, we'll find out. I don't even think we really find it out in these two chapters for this week. Reason is a response to being called into question by the other. Language is a response to the radical separation that we actually have between ourselves and others. There is an insurpassable, cannot be bridged, abyss between you and everyone else. And we erase it through language. We say, we, this word, we, we this, we that, puts us all in a big cluster and then we feel like we're the same. It's the radical reduction of the other to the same. We, you, I, it's just words, man. No, he wants to return the word I to the radical dignity of a concept. And he's going to focus on this thing. And I'm about to close out here, everybody. He's going to focus on, I'm just going to give you a whole bunch of words. If you were taking notes this whole time, well, thank you, but this is the most important part to take notes for. He's going to say, I, I would like you to put on one side the word, let's just say on the left side, totality, on the right side, infinity, on the left side, same, on the right side, other, on the left side, comprehension, on the right side, uh, what's the opposite of comprehension for him? Transcendence. Or infinity, actually. Infinity would go right there as the opposite of comprehension. On the left side, grasping. Grasping and comprehension, he used simultaneously. Like, these are interchangeable. We grasp through comprehension, he says, even if you don't own anything, you can still possess the whole world by putting it into your boxes so that you think that you have a grasp on the whole situation. Right? So yes, on the left side, we have other, we have metaphysics, we have infinity, we have a face-to-face, -face. we have justice, we have called into question, we have desire, and we have critique. Critique and being called into question. These belong... Sorry, did I just say that's the left side? I meant the whole... Yeah. Fuck, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I but, gave up on this list. Anne said she gave up on this list. God damn it. No, I mean on the right side. Other, critique, desire, metaphysics, transcendence, infinity, face-to-face, -face, justice, called in question, language, ethics, responsibility, what he'll call religion, which is another word he's using for communication, um, as opposed to the left side, which is just the same, atheism, separation, total, totalization, home, will, freedom, being, grasping, comprehension, reason, Autochtonous, that crazy word, autochtonous, belongs over there too. Autochtonous just has to do with being native to a local region as opposed to being the stranger, right? And then we would also put need on the side of the same. Desire is something that the same feels, 
but it's awakened by the other. And of course, he's going to talk about, there's all these different kinds of desires that can be satisfied, but he's going to say pure desire can't be satisfied. And the reason is because it is desire for the other. Whereas Lacan, it's like desire is desire it's, it's, it's of the other. It's like, well, yeah, but for the other. It's like the other has something that I don't. So the whole point is like, I build my own little home. I've got my own little place. I've got my own everything. I've got my possession of the world. I've got my self-understanding. I'm radically atheist in the sense that I could exist my whole life without ever having heard of God, without ever having heard of history. I'm atheist in the sense of like, I am self-sufficient. Right? This goes against the whole tendency of continental philosophy, which always says that, oh, you're actually reliant on the other because of language and society and everything. And he's saying, yeah, but guys, a baby can be born and then raised to never be reliant upon society, and it could ultimately experience its whole life as a hermit, and that is comprehensible. Right? And if we notice, people nowadays are radically solipsistic. They just live in their little worlds with their phones and they scroll and they like some things and they don't like other things and the things that they don't like make them good by default. And they just live in this little consumer bubble on this hedonistic treadmill. And knowledge is just something for overpowering others or for diffusing situations or for looking good. That's all you within your interiority, your self-sufficiency. But it leaves you depressed. It leaves you lacking. It's not enough. It's not enough because there's something that is always going to rupture that interiority, rupture the satisfaction of needs. And it is what he calls metaphysical desire, which is the desire for the absolutely other, Desi the desire to, s to serve the destitute, the desire to, to do something good for its own sake. The desire to be there for somebody who has nothing to do with you, for whom you have no responsibility. She's somebody else's wife. She's somebody, uh, that's somebody else's orphan. Like, I don't, like, this is not my problem. Ultimately, what he wants to challenge is this mode of existence that says, not my problem. And we'll leave it at that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I, you know, I really want to do some time for Q and A, but also we just actually literally have to leave. We are past time, and we have to rush out of here. And so I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday or Friday. I really hope to see um, you there. You don't have to be there. But I hope that you'll come with question marks in the margins of some of the pages and be prepared to read a paragraph that confused the living shit out of you. I have several that I am like, is he saying this or this or that? Or is it something else? I have no idea. And on Friday, we'll have Terrence to help us resolve some of those problems, which is very exciting because those who can make it on Thursday but can't make it on Friday, um, you'll give me a bunch to, of, of questions for him, hopefully, and I'll be able to bring those to him. We, those who are able to do both, will hopefully be All right, everybody, before I roll the PSA here, I wanted to do a quick interjection to just say that something I felt remiss about not having said in the original recording of this lecture, I was a bit frazzled and on the fly, so there were certain things that escaped me, and one of them was, yeah, I kind of focused on this more uh, moral and ethical kind of like interpersonal and personal aspect of Levinas specifically. Oh, like he's important because otherwise you become an asshole who uses theory just to strong arm yourself in situation, blah, 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 blah. No, look, that matters. But also he is a fundamental critic of the Marxist and Heideggerian projects, the two major currents of theory that even if your favorite thinkers are not Marxist or Heideggerian are likely influenced by one, if not both of those tendencies. And so, yeah, I think it's very uh, important to tarry with Levinas and think about him as a critic of those two tendencies, not just Hegel and Spinoza and guys like that, but definitely 
Marx and Heidegger. And so that'll be something that I develop throughout the course of this class. And so uh, if you're interested in all of that, make sure to smash like, comment, subscribe, become a subscriber at the actual theoryunderground.com website. Like over there, that's where you can uh, get access to the deep dives into the notes, get access into the these tarrying with the text sessions that we were doing that we did and are will and we'll be doing again with Terrence Blake of Agent Swarm, where we get into the translation issues of this text and he points out various concerns. And it's a lot of behind the scenes access uh that you will get, uh not just into totality and infinity and the deep dives we do there, but also a ton of other content. So I just 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 think about it. If you want to dive in deeper, then there you go. But if you're already too busy and broke, don't worry about it. We're releasing this content slowly but surely, and there's lots of great free content. All right. Well, with that, take care. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of letting others read and think on their behalf, slipstreaming our way into an understanding of the situation that short circuits the deadlocks of our moment. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. What that has meant in the last year is traveling across the United States, into Canada, and then all over Europe to promote our books, courses, and ideas related to time energy and underground theory. You've been reading Underground Theory. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best editing collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Ah, ah, ah. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing, but first I had to get freed from wage labor, which was achieved this year. That's right. Thanks to my monthly seminar subscribers, I was able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. Now I'm announcing the next big phase of the plan, which is the Mikey Down Seminar. What monthly subscribers to the Mikey Seminar are paying for is a survey of philosophy, including deep dives into Zizek, Land, Lacan, Baudrillard, Bataille, Leotard, and ultimately the whole history of philosophy. We're trying to build like this ongoing seminar, right? And that, that's what I really like about this thing, where, you know, if I'm teaching a main text, that's something I got to focus on. I got to really, but the seminar thing, we can do this stuff all the time where we dive deeper into concepts, we dive deeper into certain you know sections of books or whatever and we can really do this nuanced 
stuff. I think that there's probably no better way for us to accelerate our learning in these areas than by slipstreaming Mikey. And that has been my belief for years and years and years now. It's official. You're able to help out. You're able to get involved. You're able to benefit directly from liberating him from wage labor. Get on it right now. Do it. J just go. Stop what you're doing. Go click the button. Subscribe. That's this is what you do. Subscribe to him. If you're already signed up for the ongoing Theory Underground seminars, then that's the ones that I do with my wife, Anne. Though that's getting an upgrade which means that I will be doing one session per month that is just me. And then I will also be doing the ones with Anne, which are a crash course in sociology, anthropology, the social sciences, and ultimately Marx, Heidegger, Levinas, Bourdieu, imminently critiquing pop psychology, sociology, self-help, and ultimately the doxa of our time. But if you would like to be a subscriber to both Mikey's seminar and the seminar that the Snellgrove McCarrickers are doing, then the best way is to become a tier four subscriber, or you can be a tier two subscriber to each of us. The reason this matters is because tier two is like pretty much the best bang for your buck. It gives you huge discounts on all of the courses that we do. But uh, if you can't afford it, tier four is amazing because it gives you tier three access at both Mikey's seminar and ours. And finally, not everybody has time to be part of these ongoing research seminars, and they just want to fund the paid content for the YouTube and podcast. And so thank you so, so much to our patrons over at Patreon. They're the ones funding all the free stuff. So big thank you to Bert, Marilyn, Carl, Sahil, Zozandra, Nikolai, Darian, Tyler, and Mandeep, and all the other wonderful patron people, uh, patrons. Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. And thank you to all the other wonderful Patreon people. Thank you so much to all of you patrons and also to the special subscribers and the paying subscribers. Oh my god. <laughs> it's just so awkward. Thank you Patreon. Patron. Just thank you. Oh, okay. And to all the other wonderful patrons. Thank you so much all you patrons and also a special thanks to the subscribers on the YouTube side as well as the paying subscribers over at Substate. <laughs> Why can't we do this? Fuck. <laughs> you guys, Please. just thank you. Thank you, everyone, for making this bullshit possible. Thank you to the subscribers. You do it. You did so good. Thanks, guys.